Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today, Dan. Um, I'd love I'd love to start with just like a bit about you and your background and and sort of um, yeah, what what's led you to um, to, to where you are and into the L and D field. Yeah, thank you, Blake. Thank you for inviting me to the to the show as well. It's uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, so um, my background is I I've had twenty two years in in the insurance industry. Um, oh. And it doesn't sound very exciting, and you know, it's not exactly you know, <laughs> rock and roll, um, but uh, it is quite interesting um, area to work in. Um, my, my, my career has been predominantly working within claims areas of different types of businesses, so that customer service from front of house um, uh, part of the business. And then um, about five years ago, um, I, I changed role. I've worked around different different businesses, different types of, of companies, mm. large, uh, very large organizations to, to fairly small organizations within different areas. But then um, I, I moved into the training area and started off as a, a standard trainer. And personally, I, I, I kind of found like a, felt like I found my niche really yeah. um, within, within training. Um, it seemed to work well with a lot of the things that I've done outside of work as well. So. Um, in my in my spare time, I've I've done uh, a little bit of stand up comedy. I've done a little bit of that's awesome uh, performance. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've done I've done a bit of performance like uh, singing songwriting, and um, I've taught martial arts in the past. So I'm not shy standing in front of people and talking to them, um, and then bringing in elements of photography, and I've done a bit of copywriting and things like that. It all seems to just come together perfectly to suit the the, the role of training. Um, then I became a, a senior trainer within the, within the team and getting involved in bringing behavioral economics into the business, um, getting involved in a global L&D group where um, I built and rolled out emotional intelligence training to a, a global community um, evaluation amongst the learning and development experts as well. Wow. And then um, and, and started working with early talent programs there. And then I got promoted to a learning and development consultant where my responsibilities are early talent and development um, within the business. So looking after graduates, managing graduates, and also leadership development. And I also work with the business from a performance consultancy point of view. So I attend various forums and work with the business and, and, and look at how can we um, improve performance within the business get involved in various projects um yeah so that's that's a bit about me really i, I love it <laughs> yeah amazing it's, it's super varied so you've done you've done a bit of um some some interesting stuff that i guess i can i can totally see the segue though like from something like stand-up comedy um uh l and d like i can see i can sort of connect a couple yeah. dots not that i've done it myself and, and and i won't i won't try to put you through that um <laughs> i'm not saying i was any good uh, just, <laughs> but, but I think I think it does. It certainly helps with just having that confidence to stand in front of people mm. and talk to them. But also, if you can inject a little bit of humour into what you do, it just makes the the training that much more engaging. You know? Um, yeah, but, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a fine line to tread, shall we say? Yes, um, yes. You've got to remain yeah. professional as well. You can't go straight in there with mother-in-law jokes that's not going to go down well <laughs> yeah <laughs> you also mentioned that you're sort of responsible for for some of that performance area um uh in in respect to l d how, how do you sort of align your l d with performance or business strategy so how, how do you how do you sort of see that working yeah well it's i think it's about your your mindset and and your approach um not thinking about training we're not training people we're driving performance that's mm. what's important and so our approach our questions our analysis of problems needs to come from a performance perspective what is it that people are doing what is it that the business needs people to do what is the fundamental purpose of the business and then it's looking at well okay so what do people need to do to perform well to achieve what the business wants to achieve. Yeah. Um, and it's focusing very much on task rather than topic. 
It's focusing on what are the fundamental things that people need to know to be able to, to do what they need to do. Um, so it's, it's very much about being a partner with the business, you know, understanding what their goals are and looking at how we can support. But it's also about understanding things from a system point of view. Systems thinking is something that I think is a real game changer in an approach towards um, uh, L&D. And uh, I'm happy to explain a bit more about systems thinking if, you, if, if you'd like me to. But looking at things in a more holistic way, looking at the business as a system and understanding, well, of that performance, how much of that is equatable to knowledge, skills and behaviour and how much of it is equatable to other influences within the business. And so I think the role of L&D and the strategy of L&D is evolving. Um, yeah. Focus on performance, but also offering value in different ways. Because the traditional mindset is about training, education, you know, um, whereas actually the insight that you can offer by asking the right sort of questions and digging a little bit deeper and doing some of this double loop thinking is, is, um, is offering insight to the business in ways that they may not actually realize what's, what's happening. Um, and that can improve performance still. And you're still offering value because you're offering that insight. It's just not in the traditional, let's sit everybody in the classroom, you know, um, yeah. train building. Yeah, absolutely. I love what you said about sort of looking at those systems because generally a system is something that's measurable, quantifiable, um, and, and very, very much repeatable as well. So it's, um, you know, you, there's not success by accident. <laughs> it's success yeah. by, by, by design. Um, yeah. Well, well, a system, a system is, is anything that's made of two or more parts for a common purpose. So your body is a biological system. Your car is a mechanical system all the parts work together for a common purpose. You can't take one single part out of your body. You can't take your kidney out and say, well, that's life, that is, which is the fundamental purpose of your body. It doesn't work like that. The, the kidney only works when it's part of your body and your system mm -hmm. only works properly when the kidney's functioning in it. Similar, similar with a car. You can't take an engine out and say, well, that's transport, that is. Well, well no, it's not. It needs to be part of the bigger, bigger system. And what you often find is if you tweak one part of the system as a whole, then it can actually be detrimental to the rest of the, the system, or it actually doesn't take any effect. Now, when you look at a business, when you look at an organization, you have all these different departments. These are all your different parts or your elements, and they're all working in silos. They've all got their own objectives. And when you're looking at improving performance, you've got to look at things from a holistic point of view and understand, well, what else do we need in place to ensure the success of this change? So if you're, so if you rely on a, a, a training session on its own, for instance, if you rely just on that, there's a 15% chance of learning being implemented and seeing any change. Yeah, wow. So one of the things that you need is you need accountability measures. What that requires, it requires support from leaders to have conversations with their people, to set expectations. This is why you're going, it's called the 505 principle. Five minutes before the training, this is why you're going into this session and this is what's expected. They spend zero minutes involved while the training takes place. But then after the training takes place, it's another five minutes. What did you learn? How did you find it? Do you need any further support? How are you going to apply it? Now, when you have those accountability measures, the rate of um, applying the learning goes up to 85%. Wow. And that's just one element of looking at it systemically. So what communications do we need to send out? What computer systems, what tools, resources, do we need to consider when we look at implementing change? And so when you're looking at systems thinking, you can break it down into four, four things, really. Distinguishing the different parts, the different elements. Understanding what the system is trying to achieve as a whole. What is the business trying to achieve as a whole? 
Um, understanding the relationships and the inter interrelations, the interconnectivity between all the different parts, and then looking at the different perspectives of everyone in the system. A person, um, so heavily involved in the customer service environment that I am, I have to think about what's the perspective of the person who is the frontline member of staff on the phones, what are the, what's their perspective? What's the perspective of their manager? What's the perspective of the centre manager? What's the perspective of somebody who works in the quality team? So it's, it's looking at all of these things and bringing it all together. And you have to involve as many of different elements of the system and get them aligned to in, in, embed change and make sure that it has real impact. Yeah, so sort of driving towards that, that North Star, if you will, I, I guess, yeah. as an organisation. Um, I love what yeah. you said about that 505 principle. It's such a small thing that has such a tremendously positive effect. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's amazing. Out of all of that, so you've mentioned like a, a fair bit there. Um, what would yeah. you say is the most challenging part? Like what, what part do you, do you see people kind of maybe slip up at or, or find really difficult <clears throat> to sort of accomplish or, 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 or sort of jump over? Um, I would say, I would say a, a, a challenge is um, the traditional approach towards L&D, the, the mindset, <laughs> you know, it's education, it's classroom based, you know. Um, so I think it's a case of educating, you know, educating the, the leaders, educating uh, people on um, what it is that we do and how we can offer value these days. I think a lot of it comes down to as well, you, you, the perception of, of, of role. There's a, there's a great book actually from a, um, a lady who's based in, in over your neck of the woods um, it's, it's a book called The Insider's Guide to Culture Change um, by Siobhan McHale. And within that, she talks about roles and perception of roles and how we all wear different hats, right? So you're a best friend, you're a brother, you're a son, you know, you might be a father. With, e with each of these roles, there are different actions, different behaviours that you have. So sometimes how you name a role or how you frame something um, will change perception and will change behaviours to align with that. So I think it's the same with what we do. If you call yourself a training team, then people will think that you train. If you call yourself learning and performance, then people will see you as dealing with learning and performance and you start to shift the mindset towards what you do. Um, but it is a it is about the conversations that you have and it's about proving what you can do. I think that's the, that's the thing you have to show by doing and demonstrating what you can do to then get people on board. Yeah, absolutely. That the traditional L and D mindset, I think is a, is a hurdle for a lot of L and D professionals that we talk to anyway. And I think yeah. that, um, yeah. in particular in certain areas, maybe compliance is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, uh, stigmatized and you see it, um, and you, you mentioned a few different uh, activities there. I was, I was quite interested. So you sort of were saying, you know, people often think classroom-based, traditional learning, uh, more focused on, I guess, like knowledge, you know, and I think coming from that university and the school sort of upbringing that we have, it sort of reinforces yeah. that stereotype a bit. Um, there are those traditional activities and they've got their place and they do work really well if, if they're done really well. Um, but what other learning activities would you say uh, sort of help you accomplish that um, that sort of, you know, holistic approach that, that maybe is a little bit different to the norm. Is there anything that you've seen work quite well, um, uh, you know, throughout your time and, and career? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's considering, we have to consider the learners, right? And it might be a little bit of a controversial view, I suppose, maybe. Um, <laughs> That's a good all views are my own, just have to say, clarify that. But I think, <laughs> I think, the fact is that certainly, you know, from, from my experience as well, when I was um, working on, on, on the, you know, handling calls and in that type of environment, I didn't come to work to learn, you know, and a lot of people don't necessarily want to learn in the traditional sense. People want to do a job. A lot of people are going to work to do a job because they've got bills to pay, they've got mouths to feed, they've got other things going on 
in their, in their life. And I think when you push learning onto people, when you push assessments or push courses, if people don't know what's in it for them, or if it seems like a lot of effort or work, when you push people, people tend to push back. And that's why the 505 principle is so important because people need to understand that they're accountable for their, for their knowledge and whatnot. But I think there's a lot to be said about people don't necessarily want to learn, they want to know. They want to know what, what do I need? They want, this, they want to do a good job. So it's about how do we provide that information for people at the point of need? You know, how do we make the information easily accessible, easy to digest? And so I know in the last, in, in the last podcast, um, you mentioned about self-directed learning and you felt that it wasn't necessarily the, the, the way to go. I, I kind of half agree, I half disagree. <laughs> I think it's about how you do it. Because yep. I think that if you provide, if you provide resources, tools, the information for people, and they can pull that information when they need, they're learning the le- it's self-directed learning, but the learning is a byproduct of doing the job. Yeah. So you've got those people who just want to know, and it's about how do you provide that information so that they learn as a byproduct. But then you also need to cater for those who want to learn, who want to progress. So you need to create the environment as well um, that nurtures talent, that provides that talent pipeline of those really ambitious people that want to grow and develop. There was a, there was um, a um, statistic I, I, I read recently. I don't know where it was from, so forgive me. But it said that when looking at attrition rates, 54% of people were leaving because they didn't feel like they were being developed or they didn't feel there's any career opportunities. So you have to provide an environment in which people are able to thrive and they'll remain loyal to you and you're building that future talent pipeline and succession and and all that but also you can't forget that not everybody wants push style learning they want to learn as a part of doing the role so i think it's 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 looking at that really and, and, and taking an intelligent approach towards those two areas those two type of learners yeah i think that that's so true where what you said about how you know people don't necessarily come to work to learn and if they do it's often um uh oh i get to work under this amazing person or i get to work with this this fantastic team or in this culture and 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 pick up and learn things from there and i couldn't agree more with you about um attrition and having having a place for people feel like they're progressing i think um being sort of a founder of a startup you feel that quite a lot because uh, if you don't grow uh you know one of our big reasons we sort of say oh we got to keep growing is We've got all these awesome people and we want to keep them <laughs> but they're awesome yeah, but yeah. they want to grow as well you know and, and so we have to yeah. have an organization um it's, it's really challenging in a, in, a, in, a, in a large company as well you know because you can <laughs> there's only so many jobs and yeah. if everybody's if everybody's scrambling for the next role up well that role you know they can only move up when that role becomes available right um but you also need people that that want to come in and and are content with just doing a good job. So we need to, not everybody wants to develop. Um, And the approach toward learning, we need to make sure that it's always contextual, it's always relevant, it's always applicable. Um, And, uh, you know, experiential learning um, is is, is, is a great thing, you know, that whole 70-20-10 thing. So stretch assignments, mentoring, um, you know, job swapping, that sort of thing, I think, is a, is, is a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think fostering an environment. Um, I spoke I spoke with um, Kelly from Katmandu, and one of the big things that they do there is they turned everybody into a coach. Um, and I was like, oh, that is such a fantastic uh, way to go about it. And they sort of said, you know, we don't, we, we create managers and we create coaches. So I think that experience and and passing from from person to person is, is yeah. super impactful and just, it just works really, really well, I guess, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's touching on, on the point I made earlier on about mm. the perception of your role. You know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you call somebody a manager, they will manage people. If you call them a leader, 
and they'll lead people. If you call them a coach, then they will coach people. It's it's how do you perceive the role? And and um, yeah, it's um, I think it's something to to really uh, consider. You know, um, especially if you're doing leadership development programs, it's understanding from the senior stakeholders what is it you want your leaders to do. How how do they perceive their their role? What sort of, what does good look like? Mm. You know. Um, so yeah. What, what, I guess on that note, what's the best way you find to to get that feedback and get that information? Like um, often L and D can be siloed and, and and have a hard time sort of understanding what what aspects or what training to to sort of gather. How, how do you find the best way to interact with those different business areas or leadership teams are to sort of find out, hey, this is what you know they're looking for and, and maybe what success looks like in other areas of of the business. Yeah. Well, I think it comes down to the quality of the conversations that you have. Um, you, 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 if, if you work in L&D, you want to have a profile. People need to know who you are. Um, and so it's about knocking on those doors and it's about having those conversations and really getting under the skin of what is it that you, that you, that you want. I was in a, um, a conversation this week about a potential leadership development program and I had to say let's just you know my role is not to train my role is to improve performance so I want to understand what does good performance look like to you you know what are the tasks the specific tasks that lead to that good performance and then what skills knowledge behaviors are required to achieve those tasks and then it's a a case of okay so what else within the system is going to help embed that are you going to change objectives are you going to change um you know are you going to provide people with resources and tools what's the messaging going to be from you know um, from from the line manager perspective you know how are they going to drive those and encourage Mm -hmm. the changes in behaviors um something again from systems thinking there's a there's a f- philosophy that um, um, purpose measures method. Have you heard of this? Are you, are you familiar with yeah, this? Yeah, not super familiar, but I've definitely heard of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so um, purpose measures method. The methods that people will adopt within the role will be heavily impacted by how they're measured. If if you, if you work in a customer service environment and you're measured by how many calls you answer in a, in a day, then your, the work that you do will be focused on answer as many calls as I can in a day. That means as soon as I answer that call, I've got to get rid of that customer because I've got to answer the next call. And the quality may drop, which means that the callers call back because and the customer satisfaction drops and you know you, you could really extrapolate this out to look at how it impacts things systemically but so your measures will impact the methods that people people have but you need to consider when you provide targets you create a de facto purpose of meet the target however that is whether it's cutting corners do whatever's needed meet that target and it doesn't always drive the right behaviors or the right actions. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have to look at, well, what's the purpose of what you're trying to achieve? What really matters? What, what's really important to the customer or the, you know, the business? How do you measure? What, what are the measures, the right things to measure to achieve that? And then the methods will come about to drive those measures. So when you're having conversations about performance and and, and, and working with the, with the business is about getting under the skin. And again, it's about educating. This is not just a case of a one and done event. This is not a case of, I'll come to a two hour training session and I'll be amazing. You know, it's, <laughs> it's about let's get all these resources in place. Let's support them. What's the support structure going to be? Do you change objectives? Do you change measures? How do we get insight from the frontline staff about how their leaders are performing so that we, we get honest feedback there as well, like a 360, you know, um, and, and that will drive accountability because they're more likely to carry out 
and apply the learning if they know that we're going to get feedback from your people. You know, it's about how you're, you're getting on. And it's, it's not meant to be a, a stick to beat people with, but it's a, it's, it's a reality that look, this is the expectation to apply. We're, we're going to help you develop and, and, and build you up and give you the tools and resources. So, yeah, it's, it's, it really is about the quality conversations that you have with, with people and educate them and asking the right questions. Yeah, I think what you mentioned there about making sure the measures are correct is so, so true. Um, and I think it's why you uh, often see sales teams uh, can kind of conflict with uh, product teams or, or development teams or something because their job is to get as many people on as possible. Uh, and if that metric is just a dollar figure, um, it can create some some conflict and, and whatnot. So we, yeah, I 100% agree because we, we're very... Uh, cautious about the the kpis and the measures that we put in place here because of that and, and look we've stuffed it up and, and 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 gone down the wrong sort of uh rabbit hole before and had the team be like hey i can i can do really well here but yeah. you probably don't want that outcome necessarily you know you don't want me uh, to no. my phones and and hanging them up um yeah yeah and so i guess on, on that on that front um from a data perspective those things, do, do you sort of, um, do you find that data is quite integral to measuring those? Uh, and, and if so, sort of how do, how do you, how do you look at the data of, of those metrics and, and sort of, is, are there some things that you find from an L&D perspective that are really crucial or, or, or need to be leveraged from data? Or is it a bit of an overhyped topic uh, that, you know, it gets mentioned, I think, uh, every, every, every 10 minutes or so. So, um, yeah, did you have any sort of opinion on data and, and how you've leveraged data in the past? Yeah, da data's huge. Um, big data, personal data, sensitive data, it's all data, data, data. Um, and I think it's crucial because that's your insight. I think in an ideal world, your learning and performance team need to be aligned with the same metrics and measures that the business use and be proactive to identify in this part of the business, we've noticed there's a dip here, right? What's going on? But, you know, working with the business in a proactive way based on that data-led approach. But I think data is only the beginning. Um, I think there's so much focus on, on data that sometimes things can be, can be missed. Um, so Russ Acoff uh, was a, a prominent systems thinker, um, soft operational research was, was his um, 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 version of, of, of systems thinking. And in one of, one of his lectures that I watched, he was talking about the educational hierarchy. And I found it really interesting because his data is your bottom level. You gather all this data. That's brilliant. That's your starting point. Then to make it some, make it useful, you have to process that data. When you process that data, you've got information. That's the next level. Okay. Now, to transcend to the next level, which is knowledge, you need to ask questions, open questions, how, what, where, when, who. So that will give you knowledge. But then you take that a little step further when you can understand the reasons why that gives you understanding, which is the next level up. So you understand what's causing that data, what's the, the, the correlation between things. And that's where that double loop thinking comes in, because you, you're not just taking things at face value and trying to change something. You're looking beyond that and scratching the surface and saying, well, what is, what is driving that? What are the influences that's, that are creating that? And then the top tier is wisdom and wisdom is knowing what's right or wrong it's a culmination of all those levels below and it's asking well is this the right thing to do or is it the wrong thing to do is it is this really what the purpose of the system is is this really what we're trying to achieve here is this offering value to the customer is this driving the right thing and so there's so much emphasis on on data sometimes that we need to take it, process it, build our knowledge, build our understanding, and then question what is really the right thing to do in this situation. Um, I think, of course, as well, 
data is really important because when you identify the data that you're looking at, the indicators of poor performance, then straight away you've got the metrics that you want to have an impact on when you come to evaluate. So your evaluation should not be a retrospective thing. You should know from the off. This is the this yeah. is the, the dip that we've seen. Well, that's what we need to uh, focus on. And if we're successful in our approach, we will see an increase in that. Um, so I think, yeah, data is crucial, really. Um, it's the starting point, but it's, it's, it's not just taking it at face value. It's, you know, looking beyond that. Yeah, having an understanding as opposed to having that data for data's sake. Um, yeah. Uh, which I think happens a lot, you know. Oh, we want to just collect everything. And it's like, well, yeah. why? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And is that I, really the right thing? You know, the, the metrics, hmm. the measures, do we, do we look at uh, lead lead or lag measures, you know, and it's... it's, it's how we know what to lead in and how do we know what to lag in, you know, you've got yeah. to understand, I think, um, I think you're better to have a much smaller uh, set uh, that you've collected and actually understand it than have this gargantuan, uh, you know, library. Yeah. Um, I guess some of the benefits of, of, of sort of technology and data is that you kind of can collect it sometimes, but... Uh, maybe you know use it later on once you understand it um yeah i really like what you said though about as opposed to being you know reactive using using that to identify where there might be an issue like down the track or about to occur yeah. you know and, and sort of looking yeah. at oh no we got to address something here because um yeah. this, this isn't going the way that we necessarily wanted it to go yeah it's been it's been proactive and i'm sure you've heard this a million times but it's <laughs> moving away from being order takers yeah 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 100 yeah. percent and and I think everybody wants to fit in that category, uh, but very few do, you know, and it's, I think it's a little bit harder um, in practice than, than, than principle, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, so that's the ideal world. Yeah. <laughs> that's where we should be aiming for. And, and with, with um, I guess, get, collecting that and, and, and using some of those, um, those metrics and measures, um, that sort of bleeds in, I guess, to like the technology stack within an organization and, and how important do you see those stacks sort of being and, and the different tools that, that organizations are using? You know, there's a million buzzwords these days, LXP, LMS, you know, AI, VR, AR, um, all sorts of different things happening. Um, is there anything that you're seeing that's like really working really well to, to sort of foster a, a really good L&D sort of environment? Um, I think... I think when it comes to tech, I think there's been a, a huge shift due to the pandemic and people have had to be forced to adapt. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, I think technology has its place, but I also think we have to be wary of what is really adding value and what's offering quality. So it has its place in terms of obviously you need to collect your data to give you your your insight um and to evaluate the success of what you do that's really important you know you, you can't do that without your tech in terms of learning solutions it's great from a accessibility and flexibility mm. point of view you know um i think that we need to be wary so say for instance, okay, you've got you've got an LMS and it's an open library and people can add to it. Okay, brilliant. But there's there are some issues with that. Firstly, where's the quality control? If it's if it's like the Wild West and everyone's just adding stuff, right? And and he's like, well, okay, so Jeff wants to learn about communication skills. So he goes onto the LMS and he types in communication skills. And suddenly he's got, you know, a hundred different things to look at, articles and videos and courses. Oh, it's truth, what do I what do I do? And then which of that is offering quality? And you, you you're you're at a risk of um, you're at a risk of um, option paralysis, right? So so um, Einstein, when he first went to America, he went into a supermarket and just saw the amount of choice and he called it option paralysis. I don't know what I, what I want. You know, the brain will, will shut down when you offer too many things because it's not easy, you know. Um, and the other side of it is, well, 
how can you equate any kind of improvement in performance to, to, the, to that LMS? You know, you're offering all this or you're offering LinkedIn learning. Don't get me wrong, it's great. It's, it's brilliant, but, the, but there's a lot of naff stuff out there as well. And you're offering people access to everything. How, how, how do you ensure that there's efficiency of time, that the knowledge is applicable to what they do, and that you can equate improvement in performance to that thing? Our role within learning and development or learning and performance, or however you want to phrase it, is offering value. And we need to be able to demonstrate the value that we offer. And I don't think you can necessarily do that with, with an LMS. Okay, people get points and you can say, how many people interact with it? Well, that's great, but, but what's the difference in performance? What are people doing differently? We can't see that. Um, so, I think there needs to be some sort of quality control. I think tech is great, but if it can be where people get the knowledge at the point of need and you give them stuff that's applicable to the job and the tech is there where the knowledge is in the cloud or whatever, all the learning is in the cloud. But when somebody types in communication skills, something pops up that somebody has vetted and have said, this is good. And maybe it's even been adapted and it can say, it can be applicable to the job and it talks to the individual about their job and how they can actually apply it to what they do. Um, I think gamification is something that's, that, that's new. And I think from my perspective, there are pros and cons to it. You want to avoid the novelty element. Yeah, people will engage with it if, it's, if there's a novelty element, but again, how quickly can that be changed? I work in a very fast paced environment. A new piece of legislation comes out, everything needs to be changed, you know? Um, so how quickly is it to update that? And what are you gonna do when the novelty wears off? And again, where's the evaluation to say, this behavior, this metric has shifted as a result of this thing. So I don't think that, not everything that glitters is gold. Yeah. And you have to you have to ask the right questions. How can you create a simulation? I saw a great example actually of I went to a, a, a learning tech event a, a couple of years back and there was a virtual reality um, a session where you were learning to be a banksman and you were there was a lorry reverse and you had to stand in the right place and, and guide him and stuff like that. <laughs> and I think that kind of simulation is is great. You're you know it's simulating the environment. It's, it's difficult when you're, you have to be really creative with it when you're looking at different types of roles, I guess, and, and, and apply it correctly. So you have to, it's got huge potential, um, but it's gotta be done right. And, and for me, the question is, if you're investing a lot of money into it, what's the impact on performance? What's the change that we're going to see? Yeah. And how do you um, how do you generally find it successful to measure that change or or show that ROI on learning? Um, you know, is it to tie it back to those performance sort of metrics? Is there is there a secret source that you've seen work really well in an area um, for for that? Because I think that's where L and D they struggle a lot with that. I think um, tying it to ROI. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you look at things like soft skills training and all that, it's like how do you equate that to I think ROI is always a challenge when it comes to um, when, when, when it comes to um, e e evaluating learning because there are always certainly in the environment that I work in there are always multiple things going on mm. always multiple different initiatives and it's it's hard to sometimes go well how do we actually equate that to to the training but I think again using using technology if it's, it's about how you benchmark to start with. And if you roll out and if you can, if you can measure the engagement with a certain piece of, of material, and then you can look at, you know, the, historically the level of quality or, you know, that's the investigation from, from LND, I think that's the challenge. It's, it's, it's looking at the benchmark, 
it's applying the solution and then marrying up any improvement or not. And also getting, look, let's, let's not also rule out qualitative feedback, you know, qualitative data, reaching out to learners and, and saying, how do you use this? What works well? How could we improve it? How have you applied what you've done? So, you know, sometimes it's always about the, the metrics and the data, but let's not rule out qualitative data. If people are saying, do you know what, this is a great tool and I'd miss it if it wasn't there, you've got to listen to that. You can't ignore that. So, yeah. Yeah, I think what you said about baselining is so true. Like if you don't have that actual base to then yeah. measure the impact, it becomes kind of like a little meaningless at times. Um, and I think that's where uh, sometimes L&D teams find it tricky is that they haven't done the baselining and now they've released a training. And it's, it's like, well, if you'd, if you'd measured here, actually we can now show. And I think that's, that's really, yeah. really important. Um, I guess like on that note, how, how do you prioritize the training based on impact? Like how, how do you sort of decide what learning objectives, you know, everybody would love to have, you know, every different L and D program and all these different things. Um, but obviously we've only got so much time. We've only got so much um, resourcing to sort of put into them. How do you find you, prioritize those different L&D sort of opportunities for the organization? It's working with those stakeholders and seeing what's important to them. You know, it's the, it's the senior stakeholders that you have to satisfy at the end of the day. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, the, the, it, it, it's working with them and saying, what's the priority for you at the moment? Having those conversations, you know, what's, how's business? You know, how's things? What's your priority at the moment? And how can we help? You know? Yeah. And so, that's that's key working with those decision makers yeah so would you sort of say you'd, you'd go and um have a chat to the decision makers look at their prioritization sort of list what's important to them maybe a system to baseline that and then roll out some form of lnd based on those priority areas is that is that sort of an approach you would take yeah they, i mean it's again it's aligned with business the business kind of on full circle back to the business strategy in a way yeah yes yeah, absolutely it, to understand what's what's important to you, what's the direction that the business is going in. And then again, asking, well, how can we support that from a learning perspective? Or well, learning is just one of the tools that we can we can uh, apply. But it's understanding, well, well, how is performance driving that? Or what change in performance do you need to see? And mm -hmm. then working with the business to again analyze, understand the influences, the drivers of that performance. And if a learning solution can help support it through resources or tools or formal formal learning, then we have that, that, that scope um, of, of support. Or we can say, well, actually, you know, working with the working with the business, you know, and, and, and speaking to people. This is something that, like, that, that, that sometimes needs to be done as well. Speak to the people doing the job. What's the frontline pinch points? What's the what? What's yeah. stopping you from doing this thing? What's um, what are the barriers? And sometimes improving performance is not necessarily about building a solution, but it's about removing barriers. Um, so, yeah, it's it's um, it, it's working as a, as a as a partner to the business and understanding what the the key needs are and the direction the business wants to go in, and supporting them with that. And if it's a case of offering insight, then you've still added value. You know, yeah. because otherwise you could be doing the wrong thing. You know, you could be doing the wrong thing right, but you're still doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so, yeah, it's it's being efficient and effective in what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that engaging with stakeholders is is definitely the, the key, you know, and, and, and sort of bringing it back to that business strategy. Um, you've had you've had a, a, a bit of a varied experiences and, 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 and career by the sounds of it. Um, I guess my, my sort of my final question for you would be, uh, do you have any lessons or key lessons that, that you would share with somebody who's like maybe new to L&D or even has been in L&D for a while that you think um, would, would really help them? Like how, I mean, it's pretty hard to boil down sort of 22 years and, and, and uh, you know, all those different activities that you mentioned, a bit of stand-up comedy, uh, uh, you know, yeah. working on the front lines into into a you know a few words of wisdom but but what would those sort of be um i would say firstly shift your mindset to performance 
You are not there to train people, you are there to improve performance. Um, I would say it is crucial that learning and development people are learners themselves. How can you drive learning and be passionate about it if you're not looking at upskilling yourself at every opportunity as well? Yeah, absolutely. Remain curious. Um, ask questions to understand. Don't think that you have to know all the answers because you don't, you know. And I would say in terms of things to look into, I would say research systems thinking. I would say that's a game changer. I would say look at behavioural economics. That will help not only in terms of understanding how people think and how people make decisions, but it will, for me it's changed the quality of my presentations, you know, and how I design the, the quality of my presentations, you know, um, so that I don't overwhelm people. And, and also when you're looking at, at potential solutions, looking at could you apply some choice architecture um, which is about nudging people to make better decisions rather than you know it's mitigating error um, creating a reference based solution rather than a, a knowledge based solution so behavioral economics is really good um, and systems thinking so I'd, I'd, I'd recommend looking into those things as well and I think that's a good starter for 10 they've got plenty to go with with that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I um, we often get books sort of bought up in, in our chats, and I've um, I, I, was, I was thinking I need to put together a reading list actually, and, and start yeah. to quantify all those different different things to look into and books that people have, have referenced. Um, but yeah, look, performance, one hundred percent. I really like what you're saying there about you know, don't think about learning, think about performance because that's what the business wants and and that's what individuals want too, right? They want to perform yeah. better so that they can, um, you know, maybe move into a new role or, you know, whether yeah. it's they, they just want to do better. Everyone wants to feel like they're um, they're out there crushing it. So I think that's such yeah. a good a good way of putting it and, and just changing the word learning to performance is a subtle change but has a huge impact, right? Like even me thinking about it, it like, yeah, that's a big, big difference, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Dan, um, thank you so much for, for for coming on and and having a chat with me for, for the last hour or so. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, anytime. Um, and, and yeah, look, if people want to reach out to you, we'll, uh, we'll we'll tag your LinkedIn and 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 pop it yeah. up there. Um, uh, but yeah, look, thank you so much, and and uh, enjoy the rest of your your morning. Uh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Time for a second coffee, I think. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. I'm Blake Provitz, and you're watching the Strategic L&D Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with our latest releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you just want the audio, you'll find us on most common podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you again soon.